I, I know you probably romanticize my life. You probably think that I ride around in a stretch limousine, eating caviar, hanging with the rock stars, but I don't. My life is pretty boring. I'm probably the most boring, mundane person in this room. I have shared with you my favorite pastime is watching television. And um, I, am a, uh, I am a connoisseur of bad TV. And occasionally I get on this DIY kick. And um, you, you know those television show, uh, channels like HGTV, DIY. Um, you know, even some like the History Channel will have some of these all, uh, sometimes. But these where they take something and restore them, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking... I've watched a show on Netflix called The Repair Shop, and it's a, a little bitty shop in England, and they specialize in taking old things and then refurbishing them and making them new. Uh, I've seen them do watches and furniture and things like that. I, I, I like watching shows like Counting Cars, where they'll take old jalopies that they find in a junkyard somewhere, and then they'll bring them in and they'll completely restore them. Another one like that is Rust Valley on Netflix. But these are, you know, over time, the things that we purchase get broken. They get scratched up. They get dented. And eventually they become unusable. But these shows that I watch are shows about people who will take these worn out items and then restore them. And they'll do it. Uh, you can, I mean, just think of something and they can restore it. Watches, furniture, automobiles. I mean, it just runs the gamut. Like, I was, they ha, you'll take the old, their grandparents' old nightstand, you know, and it's got like uh, rings from where they've let the cup set overnight and water rings and spots and stains and, you know, and they'll, they'll all sand it down real nice and, and, and they'll take the, the nicks out of it, and they'll fill the little holes, and they'll restain it. And before you know it, it's just like it was brand new. Uh, they'll take that old pickup truck, and, and, you know, that thing's been sitting in a field for like 50 years, and it's all rusted out, and they have to pull it out with a tow truck and put it on the back of a trailer and take it somewhere because it doesn't run. But, the, you know, with a little bit of hard work, a little bit of elbow grease, and a lot of parts, <laughs> Right? It won't be long before they've restored that truck and taken it to some auction or some show somewhere. You know, just like those things, those everyday items, they, they get broken and busted. And people can get broken. They can get scratched up. They can be dented. They can even get to the point where they feel like they're unusable. But think about how much more valuable is a human life than a 57 Chevy. Humans are way more valuable than that. Why would we not invest in their restoration as much and as with as much passion as we do the things of this world? And so this morning, Paul is going to address the Christian's responsibility to engage in the restoration process of, of other people. And I, I admit, as I was reading through this, to me, the, these types of things that we're going to study this morning it feels like it's an overwhelming task. Uh, and I I'm often go, I don't know even where to begin or how to do that, or it's extremely uncomfortable. But what Paul, the point of what Paul is going to say this morning is, yes, it is difficult. Yes, it is challenging. It's tough. But you can do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to live according to the Spirit, and you have to do life within the, within the context of a community of believers. If you have your Bibles, look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. We'll start in Galatians 6, 1. And I'm only going to read this one verse. We'll start with this one verse, and then I'll finish with the rest of it in just a second. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Paul says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Immediately you should notice that Paul uses this term he addresses and says brothers and sisters. He's 
talking to Christians, talking to those of us that have been adopted in the family. This is, his instructions here is exclusive to those who identify with Christ. This is not necessarily applicable to people who do not have a personal relationship with Jesus because he uses that term, brothers and sisters. He's highlighting the unique relationship that we have with one another. You're my brothers and sisters. And, and so he's actually, this is a callback to his earlier statements about what it looks like to be a Christ follower, about our status, about how we've been adopted into God's family as his children. We're, we shouldn't be strangers. We're, we're not simply acquaintances. In this room, you are my brothers and sisters. And, and you are part of the family. We're all part of the family. And, and as part of the family, we should be intimate like family, right? You treat, do you not treat your family different than you treat people from uh, the other, outside? Don't you treat your family different than your coworker? Don't you treat your family different than your next door neighbor? I mean, if we truly love one another, we should treat each other as family. Now, I admit, sometimes that can be good or bad. I mean, if you grew up with my sister, you would immediately say, you don't want to treat me like family. Um, but in general, right, in, 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 the, in this context, to see other people as family is to see them through the lens of love. I mean, we want to see our family prosper and grow, don't we? I mean, don't we want to see our family members be successful? Don't we want to see our family members live in peace? Don't we want to see our family members be protected from harm or violence or, or devastation? I know I do. I mean, me and my sister fought like cats and dogs growing up. But I want what's best for her. I want to see her being prosperous. prosperous and I want to see her being successful. But I, we all know how difficult life can be. Life is full of challenges. I mean, every day you hear about somebody who's lost their job or, or somebody that's going through marriage difficulties or divorce. or the, uh, the, We have people all the time in, in our family that are living with loneliness or people in the family here that are struggling with sin or their kids have... Uh, turned bad, or they're, they're some experiencing some sort of physical suffering or an abuse or an addiction. I mean, it's not a secret. Christians are not immune from those things. We deal with them too. We're no different than the rest of the world. Those things exist in our lives too. We are far from perfect. We're all fallible. Even the best of us stumble and fall at times. We give in to our temptations and we make poor decisions. We, we stumble and sometimes we just simply wander from the faith, you know. It's easy when you miss church a couple of times. Have you ever noticed you miss church a week or two, how easy it is then the subsequent weeks after that, that you, it's easy to miss too? And, and that's, you, you drift away, don't you? You know, as, as members in this family, in this body of Christ, when we recognize a brother or sister that's caught in the trappings of sin or they're drifting away or, or wandering from the rest of the flock, we have a duty and a responsibility to see to their restoration. You know what? Let me just say this. When, when people go through challenges of life like I've just mentioned, okay, all of those things that I just listed out, when you see people go through those types of things in their life, if you secretly delight in watching people go through that, that is unbiblical. And that tells me that you are not part of the family of God. And so if, if what I've just said has brought a little guilt to your soul, I think you need to spend some time in repentance because that's an indication that your sin nature is fostering jealousy in your life if you secretly delight when people struggle with sin. If they're your brothers and sisters, you should want the best for them. If, if, if you secretly delight when you see 
your, your, that other person that you're a member of the same body with go through a trying time in your life, and you're kind of celebrating that secretly. You may not even say it out loud, but it's like uh, he kind of deserves it. I kind of like to see him taken down a notch. That's unbiblical. You need to repent from that. That's div- divisive in the family. Now, let me, that's free. All right, let me go back to the topic at hand. Right? It, the word it, he's talking about here is this idea of restoration, of restoring one another. With that word to restore or restoration, it's kind of like mending a broken bone. You know when you break a bone, you set it back in place, that's, you allow it to mend itself, that's, that's you restore it back to its original condition. I, I often think of like a fishing net that gets ripped. It, when a fishing net is ripped, that net is worthless, right? Because all the fish can go out that one hole. But when you mend it back, that net is stronger than ever. But when we, and so falling to temptation or wandering from the faith, that, those types of ideas, that reminds me, I've seen all these viral videos in the, uh, the past year of animals getting caught in a trap. Have you seen any of those? Or I, I was watching one of a, it was a handy cam video of a guy that was in a kayak or a canoe and he come upon a, a deer up in New York in Long Island Sound and the deer had a bucket on its head and it was swimming in circles in Long Island Sound. And so the guy in the canoe grabs the deer and pulls the deer into the canoe and takes the bucket off of his head and then takes him to shore and releases him. You know, that's, that's my idea of what it looks like for one Christian to help another one. I, a, another video I saw was this great big huge elk that had been caught in a mud pit. And two hunters come upon this elk and they see it. And, and what do they do? They get a lasso, and they lasso his rack, and they drag him out of the mud so that he can be free. That's the image that I have of Christians just lovingly pulling their brothers and sisters from that quicksand, quicksand of sin. And that, what I've just said, that goes completely against the idea of, hey, that's none of my business. I, I don't... I don't, I don't care. They, they can do their own life, right? Now, I admittedly and ashamedly admit that I have done that. I've seen somebody engaged in some sort of personal sin that's absolutely derailing their life and me go, it's really not none of my business, right? But is it? I mean, if, if, if we seek this, to the restoration of the spiritual welfare of one another, don't we all benefit? When one of us stumble, don't we all kind of take a step back? Isn't it a chink in our armor? I think so. We're all part of one body. And and Paul talks at great length about how if one part of your body isn't functioning properly, the rest of the body is going to suffer as well. And so this idea of, hey, you know, that's really, mm, that's none of my business. I'm just it go, What Paul is saying here, it flies in the face of that. You know, if, if we're to restore or help that person back on the right path, like Paul is saying here, there's a right way and a wrong way to do this. There's a right way and a wrong way to restore our fellow believers. We, we have to do it with two ways, gentleness and humility. You have to make sure that you are, look at what he says, if, says, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly, that's the first thing, you who are godly, or your translation may say, you who are spiritual. And that just really means, number one thing, you need to check yourself first and make sure that you've dealt with your own sin and that your hands are clean and that you don't have that log sticking out of your own eye and that you have humbly repented of your own sin before you take on the task of restoring someone else. That's what, it, that's what it means when he says, you who are godly. So we have to avoid 
any appearance of appearing judgmental. Make sure you eliminate your arrogance and your self-righteousness. I, I love it when it says, be of sober mind. It really means just take an honest look at yourself. Are your hands clean? I mean, think about that. Are your hands clean? You're, you're wanting to help this other person get clean. Are your own hands clean? I, one of the things I, I really lamented in my time as a youth pastor was I would have people come to me and say, hey, you need to teach these young people or you need to say something to these young people about smoking or whatever, you know, just name something. And I'm all go, always going, hey, young man, I'm not the sin police. And I, I don't think that we are called to be sin police. We do not take it upon yourself to be the monitor of everybody's sin in the room. That's not our responsibility. Your responsibility is not to be hyper aware uh, of everybody's life. And then whenever you see something, you call them out, you know, that's, and, and then condemn them. That's not the way Christians should live. Now, it's a fine balance because we still do have to pay attention to those who are headed down this destructive path. So there's, there's tension in that of being aware of when people are headed down a destructive path versus simply being the sin police. The bottom line is we gotta sh- we got to show that we care about the individual and not so much for the process of discovering their sin. Does that make sense? It, it should grieve us as Christians to see our family being defeated by the enemy, shouldn't it? And so we want to gently and humbly restore them. uh, Gentleness is a a key characteristic of this because if if you approach them in, in the wrong way, things could go bad real quick. And so if you see an animal that's caught in a trap, I was watching another viral video of a guy that there was, a, I think it was like a, a, a coon that was caught in a trap and he was going to try to let the coon go. And so you, you walk up to it gently, right? You just don't brazenly walk up to it and say, yeah, and you're going to get bit. You've, there's a right way to approach these things. And if you approach a fellow brother or sister in this circumstance and you use strong words or you're very harsh, that will be interpreted as arrogance or unkindness. So you have to be gentle, you, but you also have to be careful. You, you need to be aware that whatever they're wrapped up in, you could get wrapped up in too. We're all susceptible to these things. And the last thing that needs to happen is for them to drag you down. I, I used to do a... Um, a little demonstration with my students whenever I was a youth pastor, and, and I'd stand in a chair and say, is it easier for me to pull you up from the ground or is it easier for you to pull me down off the chair? Of course, it's easier for someone to pull you down. And, and so that's the last thing you want to have happen when you, you, you see a brother that needs restored or a sister that needs restored. The last thing that needs to happen is you wind up just like them You don't want to get ensnared in their misery, do you? So make sure that you guard yourself. Make sure that that you're offering this compassionate hand while you're still attached to to the the rock yourself. Make sure that, that you have a strong anchor. And this whole process of restoring another person is, of all of the things that we're called to do as Christians, doing life in community, this to me is one of the most challenging and difficult things that we have to do because sometimes people don't want to get rescued. Sometimes people don't want to be restored. Uh, you know, the, the deer that I mentioned earlier in that viral video where they had the bucket on its head, as the guy approaches it in his canoe, the deer starts swimming away from him. Isn't that crazy? Uh, I'm here, and the guy's calling out, I'm here to help. I'm here to help. And, the, of course, the deer probably didn't speak English. But, but the, the deer kept swimming away. 
the, the guys that found the elk in the mud pit, when they lasso him, number one, he didn't want to be lassoed. And number two, when they finally got him lassoed, he fought against the lasso. He was trying to pull them the other way, right? You know, it's, it's uncomfortable to have your failures and your weaknesses pointed out. I get that. And, and whenever you do, whenever you see that brother that is going down that wrong path and you embark on this process of restoring them, you're going to find that it's going to be extremely uncomfortable for both you and them as you have to approach them. And they might scoff at you. They may lash out at you. They could possibly rebuke you or be rude to you or even ab- outright refuse your help. It's challenging. But here's what I know about Christians, true Christians, because true followers of Jesus, when that's pointed out to them, they will earnestly desire to be restored. Even if it's going to be super painful, when they're confronted with their sin, they're going to say, yeah, I need help, I need rescued. And so although it may be challenging, and there's going to be a lot of difficulties, we still have a duty and responsibility to do it. And so be aware that nothing within the process of of restoring your brother is achievable by you and your experiences, your talents, and your cunningness and your strength. That whole process of restoration of a brother is only possible when you are living within the Spirit's power. It has to be the work of the Holy Spirit. You're not good enough. You're broken too. You're flawed as well. The only perfect thing that you possess, the only tool that you possess that's going to restore your brother is the power of the Holy Spirit at work through you. And whenever you decide you want to tap into something about yourself to add to that process, it's a non-starter. It will fail. So trust in God's Spirit within you when you approach somebody, you got to know the right thing to say. Ask God. Say, God, I need your spirit to speak through me. I need to know how to approach this, this particular situation so it doesn't set them off or they don't go swimming away. Trust in God's power within you. Look at verse 2. It says, Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. So, Number two there on your study guide, those who live by the Spirit will willingly help others in times of need. This is the second thing that those who, are live, by, who live by the Spirit will do is that they share one another's burdens. Uh, you know, what a burden is a weight that you carry around. And in this context, it's talking about the troubles and the sufferings and the trappings of life. We are to come alongside one another when life gets heavy, when the troubles and sufferings of life are just too much for one person to bear. We are to come alongside and we're to help that person when life gets tough. We're to help relieve the pressure, if you will. And that means, that requires that all of us have to be alert to the difficulties that other people are experiencing in life and we need to be quick to respond to those things. Jesus said this in John 16, and and so I I think it's safe to assume that every single person in this room will experience undue hardships, these types of burdens, because Jesus said, 1633, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. Now, notice he doesn't say, you might have, or maybe you will. He says, you will have. It's a sure thing. It's, it's 100% guaranteed. That's the reality for every man, woman, and child on this planet is life gets tough. You'll have bear, uh, burdens that will weigh you down. And I mean, let's face it. It's difficult and embarrassing to share your tribulations with other people. Any time that I've experienced a failure in my own life or 
or I, I know of a weakness in my own life, it's embarrassing for me to come clean about those things. But you know, you know why it's embarrassing and why I don't? It's because of pride. You can't let pride stand in the way of doing what's best for us. And so for the one who has a burden, I would ask, are you willing to share that burden? Or are you going to let pride stand in the way? And are you going, Do you have a martyr complex? Do you like the fact that you, everybody that's around you can look like, oh, it's just poor Jason, just look at the burden, he's having a bear. And people come along, hey, can I help you with that? No, no, no. I'm going to be in misery for the rest of my life. You know, it's like uh, I heard the comedian one time talking about the old hound dog that was laying on the front porch, and he was laying on a nail, and he just sat there and howl, ow! And it was just amazing to the old farmer because he kept looking at the dog, and he said, why do you want to lay there and howl on that, that nail? Why don't you get up off of it? Because sometimes we just enjoy the fact that the nail's sticking us, Right? We just kind of like the fact that we sit there and howl. It brings a little bit of attention to us. It makes people feel sorry for us. But you can't be too proud to let other people look behind the curtain of your life. Now, of everybody in this room, I am probably the most private human being in here. You guys don't know a lot about my life, and that's on purpose because that's how I roll. I am, I am uh, an introvert. And my idea of, of the perfect life is a cave with Wi-Fi. That's, that's it. But even I recognize that there are times I've got to let people look behind the curtain. I've got to let them into my life. Uh, you know, the Bible tells us, it says, cast all your cares upon Him because He cares for you. That's true that we should cast all of our cares on, on Jesus, that we can do that. But we also need the support of our fellow Christians as well. That can't be the only solution. God has put us in a community with other believers so that when life gets difficult, they can carry the burden. You see it all through the Bible. Moses, when he's leading millions of people out of the Egypt into the promised land, there's a point in time where the the obligations of his responsibilities were so great that he couldn't bear it. He's having a nervous breakdown. And his father-in-law pulls him to the side and says, hey, pull your head out of your rear end and, and think about how this should work. You need to delegate. You need to get some more people to come alongside you. Don't be a martyr. Don't drag this stuff around and lay on the nail and howl. Get up off it. And Paul... Paul recognized, Paul says over and over and over in his writings and his letters, he mentions several times what a great assistance Barnabas and Titus and Timothy were to him in his ministry. Paul recognized, I can't do this by myself, I need help. And, and when, when human beings live in this type of community where we come alongside one another and, and to help carry that burden, when it's the idea of being yoked together, like a, a team of horses or mules. You know, isn't it heartwarming to know that somebody's there pulling alongside you? Knowing that, that you're going to get through something with someone else's help and that you're not all on your own. And this is the reason why I will, just a little stump speech here for just a second, it is so important for you to be active and involved in a small group in this church. You know what? Every Sunday morning before we meet in here, there are small groups that meet all over the rest of the building. Do we do that just to occupy your time? No. We do this and we try to keep those groups as small as possible so that we can care for one another. And, and I w want to just mention, I really appreciate what Brian Osborne does in his Sunday school class. He cares for his Sunday school class. He cares for those members. 
He wants to know what's going on in your life and so that not only he can pray for you, but he can come alongside you. And those of you that feel the burden of life pressing down on you want to wail while that nail sticks in you, get up and get in a small group. Allow somebody else to carry the burden. But no, I might have to speak up in Sunday school class. I promise you, nobody's going to single you out. Nobody's going to make you feel uncomfortable. But we can't carry each other's burdens if we don't know about them. Church staff gets a bad rap a lot of times because people say, well, you didn't come visit me when I was in the hospital. Did I know you was in the hospital? Do I have ESP? By the way, just this is free. I'm not on Facebook 24-7. Okay, and so if you think that you're communicating to the rest of the world your problems by putting it on Facebook, you're missing me because I'm probably not going to see it. I'm not surfing Facebook 24-7. If, I, if there's something going on in your ni- life that I need to know, you need to let me know. I have a cell phone. You can have my number. You can text me. You can call homing pigeons, drop by, whatever. But don't think that just because I've put it on Facebook, you should know. I'm not going to know that. You've got to communicate. You've got to let people know about your burdens so that they can come alongside. And that's what it means. That's, that's any time that we do come alongside our brother and sister and carry those burdens, we're showing love, which means that we're fulfilling the law of Christ. That's, look at verse 6 or at verse 2 again. It says, share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. How do we obey the law of Christ? By loving one another. Because Jesus said, that's my new law. This new commandment I give you, love one another. And again, just like restoring your brother, carrying another person, helping to carry another person's burden, is only possible when you live by the Spirit. It's required. Look at verse 3. If you think you are too important to help someone... You're only fooling yourself. You are not that important. And so anyone that feels like they're too good to help another person, you're being deceived about your own personal worth. And, and what, what's really going on, you're, you think that you're above helping them because of your pride. Pride will create a heart that resists humble service. And, and your fellow brother or sister in the faith will suffer because of your pride. And you have to understand why that's all true, because pride is the ultimate outcome of people who live by the flesh. You can either live by the flesh or you can live by the Spirit. If you choose to live by the flesh, the thing that's going to be produced out of that, there's a whole list of them there at the end of chapter 5. You know, he says... uh, Moral immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, all of those things that he listed there. At the, all, pride's the result of all those things. And God hates pride. Proverbs 16.5 says, The Lord detests the proud and will surely be punished. Now, just side note about pride, just for a second. I want to make sure that I point this out. I ain't hating, right? You all know me. I'm a loving guy. I'm a people person, right? You know what month this month is, right? Pride month. What does God hate? God hates pride. And so, some level, those that are celebrating Pride Month are celebrating the very thing that God hates. Because proud people shift the ultimate confidence from God to self. That's what they do. It's not about God, it's about me. And God hates it. Not only does He hate the act that it represents, He hates pride. Oh, that's free. Okay, back to our normal broadcast. The only way that we as believers can authentically share the burdens of our fellow Christians is by living according to the Spirit. Look at verse 4. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. And you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. This is the companion verse to, chat, to verse 3 
as we go about this process of restoring one another and sharing each other's troubles, the idea here is that you need to stay in your lane. Don't get caught up in the temptation to compare yourself to other people. When you see them and their burdens and their failures, don't get prideful about this because you, you will fall, when you fall into that comparison trap, you will ultimately fall into a type of sin that is detestable to the Lord as well. The process of restoration demands a humble heart from both parties. The one that's offering the help to carry the burden should be humble. The one that is, has the burden should be humble to share it. Now, there's a difference here in what the Scriptures say. The word there at, at the... Look at verse 5 again. Because it says, For we each are responsible for our own co- conduct. Other translations may say something like, Each are responsible for our own load. Um, this is the idea that it's not a burden, it's a personal responsibility. What, what Paul is saying here, just to kind of clarify the difference in the two, is that burdens are unbearable things that people can't carry by themselves. But there is personal responsibility in your own life, your own calling, that you're responsible to take care of on your own. This, it's, it's, it's really the word is load that's used there in verse 5. For we are each responsible for our own load is what it should be translated as. It's the idea of your own backpack, the own things that God has placed on you. So don't be shifting your personal responsibilities to other people. You should handle your own load and be aware when someone's load becomes a burden and then come alongside them. Our loads become burdens extremely quickly. And in the blink of an eye, uh, when, when you're in the midst of grief or abandonment or, or any kind of devastating life event, a load can become a burden. Like when a husband walks out and leaves the mom with four little ones. Her load has now become her burden. Christians should be wise to be able to recognize that her load is now a burden. It's not her own doing. This is the result of someone else's sin that, and, and it has shifted all this weight onto her by herself. And as Christians, as the church, we should be the first to come alongside and say, how can we help? Number three, those who live by the Spirit reap eternal rewards. Now this point adheres to the law of the harvest. This is not a financial lesson per se. This is more a lesson in personal holiness because look at what it says. It's, look at verse 6. Those who are taught the Word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. I'm not going to touch that one. You do with that one what you want. A little, a little self-serving if I address it. But number 7, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from the sinful nature, but those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. So this is just really kind of the last point that I want to make is that there's this law of the harvest that exists is that as we live by the Spirit, we're planting good things. You live by the flesh, you plant bad things. And the law of the harvest states, number one, you're going to sow what you reap. And so if you plant corn, don't go out and expect to harvest grapes. You're going to get corn. And and so if If you're living according to the flesh, what you're doing is planting fleshly things. And so, if you, but however, you know, if you live according to the Spirit, you're going to be planting good things and you're going to be harvesting love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Those things are going to come to you. You're going to reap what you sow. 
The second thing is that you're going to reap in a different season than you plant. There's no immediate payoff. It's down the road. Sometimes, sometimes it won't even happen in this life. Sometimes those benefits that you're going to reap is eternity. Uh, the blessings that God will give you when you meet Him. And the third one is that you'll reap more than you sow. You ever notice you put one seed in the ground and you don't just get one apple? You put one seed in the ground, you get a whole apple tree with all kinds of apples. And then each of those apples, one apple has multiple seeds in it. You, this is the, it's the process of multiplication. And the fourth one is that whatever you've harvested in the past doesn't mean you're going to harvest that same thing in the future. Sometimes you might have a bountiful harvest. Sometimes it may be pretty slim. But the point that he wants to make here is that each sowing season is different. But you've got to continue to plant. You've got to continue to sow. Now, Christians are, we're different from the rest of the world, right? Christianity is. This world is a dog-eat-dog world. Christian relationships are different, though. It's supposed to be authentic. They're supposed to be compassionate and caring for one another and supportive. We should come alongside other people and help them navigate the narrow path. We've got to pick each other up when we fall. You ought to be aware of when your brothers and sisters are languishing away under the burdens of life. And then you've got to help them carry those burdens. And the one thing that will keep you from doing that is if you're living according to the flesh. When you live according to the flesh, all those things that I just mentioned, you're going to be oblivious to them. That's why as a good gardener, you want an abundant production from the garden, you've got to tend to your garden. Every day, ask the question, who is leading my life? The spirit of the flesh. Who's leading? Because if you're not making adjustments all along the way, you're going to wake up and your garden's going to be full of weeds. And the, the bountiful harvest is going to dry up. And so when you're confronted, if, if you're the one that is confronted by your sin... Be transparent, be teachable, be open to receiving that problem or that help. If you're the one that's got all the burdens, be willing to share those burdens. Be willing to allow other people to come alongside you. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 says this. Look at verse 9. Do not get tired of doing what is good. Life is hard. Restoring other people, sharing burdens is exhausting. And there are plenty of opportunities for discouragement. But do not give in. Do not give up. Keep sowing. Continue loving. Resist the temptation to become prideful about sharing those things. Settle your conflicts quickly. Be amicable. Support good teachers. Contend for the gospel. And always remember... There was one who carried your burdens to the cross. That's why we should be willing to restore and carry other people's. He did it to restore us. And that's the model that's been set before us. He completed the task of reconciling us to God. And so, if you responded to faith in Christ's work at the cross... You now have the Spirit living within you. And that makes it possible for you to find the strength necessary to help others through that restoration process and carry the burdens. Christ did an incredible work at the cross. Our responsibility is to continue to live it out every day. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for the love and grace that you've shown us through your cross and through the work of Christ that, there. And um, Father, I recognize that this is difficult, this is challenging, this is, um, this is a process that's not fun. It's a process that's wrought with temptation and frustration, pitfalls. But God, we, we can trust and know that your spirit can fill us with the strength that we need to accomplish all of the tasks that you set before us. 
We love you and we appreciate all that Christ has done for us. Give us eyes to see and, and a compassionate heart for those around us as we do life together. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hi, thank you for watching. If you want to see more great content like this, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to ring the little bell to be notified when we add new videos. Since our founding in 1877, our goal here at Arnhart has been to create God-centered teaching available for everyone, regardless of their status or station. Today, that looks like making trustworthy Bible teaching available to everyone, even if they don't make it to a church building on Sunday. So for more information, check out our website at arnhart.org or join us live on Facebook Sundays at 1045 a.m. As always, we love you and hope to see you next Sunday.